I'd like to thank Dr. Orient and the members of the Doctors for Disaster Preparedness for the opportunity to talk about the Shifting Sands project that uh, I've been working with, with uh, Stan Young for the last uh, four years, uh, looking at the reproducibility issue in science. So I'm doing this talk for Stan. He actually had committed to looking after his daughter's horses on her farm. So he's a very multi-talented person. Okay. And together we're working with David Randall, who is the research uh, director for the National Association of Scholars on this project. And if you recall, some of you may have been here five years ago, David gave a talk on a book that he had published with uh, Christopher Welser, The Irre Irreproducibility Crisis in Science. So governments issue regulations based on public scientific research. And uh, government regulations should uh, pass a high barrier of proof, but do they? And Shifting Sands is uh, looking at uh, what type of regulations are used in government in a number of different areas. For example, Environmental Protection Agency, <clears throat> If I get a glass of water, please. Also, the uh, Food and Drug Administration, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and some other areas. So, thus far, under Shifting Sands, the, with the National Association of Scholars, we've produced three reports, published seven scientific papers, and we posted three preprints on Cornell University's uh, website, archive.org. In addition, we've uh, published about uh, a dozen opinion editorials on various websites, <clears throat> including the American Council of Science and Health, American Institute for Economic Research, American Thinker, the Heritage Foundation's uh, The Daily Signal, and then Anthony Watts, What's Up With That? Uh, catastrophe theory covers how there can be smooth transitions until a disaster strikes. A body of water can be smooth at the surface until a random weather event occurs, waves come crashing through, and a catastrophe occurs. By analogy, science seemed to move smoothly for a number of decades, and then Somewhere near the late 1980s, mid-1990s, science went sideways. Most research claims cannot be reproduced. So what has happened now is that good science has been crowded out of the literature by bad science. Shifting Sands has looks, looks at a number of areas of science, including environmental epidemiology, nutritional epidemiology, COVID science, and then the science behind the framework of diversity, equity, and inclusion, implicit bias. This is one of Stan's favorite slides. I'm sure Willie has seen it before. But uh, bunnies in the sky is a metaphor for a random sighting given many opportunities. If you look at clouds long and hard, you will see something. There is no difference in looking at data in observational studies. How data analysis is done explains why many statistically significant comparisons do not stand up. <clears throat> some, some terms I want, I'm going to be using for the rest of the presentation, when I refer to positive effects or associations. That means that factor A leads to more of outcome B. Could be a disease or something. When I refer to a null outcome, factor A does not lead to more of B. Or a negative association. So in fact, factor A causes less of outcome B. So we will see a bit of that in the, in the presentations. 
I want to spend a couple of uh, slides talking about our methodology. That's important. Um, I've always tried to teach my students that science is the method. And if the method is flawed, so is the evidence. So we use p-value plots to test for irreproducibility of research claims. The plot is used to visually check characteristics of test statistics, p-values, addressing a specific research question. Does factor A cause outcome B? How do we do this? Well, we take test statistics from observational studies. A lot of them are related to the medicine area, nutrition area. So these could be relative risks, odds ratios, effect sizes, and percent differences, and their corresponding confidence intervals. We convert them into p-values and display them in a plot. If there is little or no association between factor A and outcome B, these p-values will plot as a 45-degree line, as shown here. So this is a uh, study that uh, Stan had actually uh, published a number of years ago, uh, looking at uh, the claim that uh, women who eat breakfast cereal would have more boys than girls. So, uh, so he got the, actually got the data from them and calculated the p-values for 262 hypotheses tests that they used to make this claim. And as you can see, it plots as a 45 degree line. It's not true. So why does a data set plot as a 45 degree line in a p-value plot? This is an explanation from our, in the appendix of our first National Association of Scholars report. Um, we generated a series of 100 results hypothesis tests designed to confirm or reject an unspecified null hypothesis. So they are p-values. And if we look on the plot on the left, that's a scatter plot. They're presented in the order that the, our, the software program that we used, random number generator, um, they're uh, presented by the order that the, uh, the program presented the results. On the horizontal axis is the number. On the vertical axis is the value of the p-value, a true scatter plot. If we look on the right, if we take those values and reorder them by rank, smallest to largest, we see a near 45 degree line, total random numbers. So if we see a set of results in an observational study that looks like this, it's telling us they are purely random or chance results. And then we can assess whether their claim is true or false. We use statistics from published meta-analysis of observational studies. So meta-analysis is a uh, statistical procedure that combines results of multiple scientific studies. If we look at the uh, figure on the left, that is the analogy of how these, this meta-analysis is done. The literature is searched and a, a number of studies are identified and they go into the hopper. They are screened and analyzed and out the bottom comes a number of specific studies that are further quantitatively analyzed for meta-analysis. Anywhere from 100 to 1,000 studies might initially be identified, screened, and anywhere from, say, 10 to 100 studies might be selected for, for meta-analysis. If we look at the right figure, that shows that hierarchy of uh, evidence-based medicine, we can see on the top that uh, meta-analysis is highly regarded. So in essence, we're trying to look at the best of the best studies that are trying to answer a research question. Does factor A cause outcome B? Meta-analysis meta is at the top of the heap, so to speak. And my supervisor used to say to me many times that uh, he shuddered to think what type of medicine was used before they invented the term evidence-based medicine. So it's just an invention. Do p-value plots work in practice? Here's some examples. 
of this, in this case, small data sets. Plots on the left I'm going to show you are true nulls, no association. Uh, the first one here is for a 2018 meta-analysis of selected cancers in petroleum refinery workers. So on the one on the left, they're looking at uh, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, and we see a 45-degree line and a null uh, outcome. Now, just an important point, uh, there were 12 observations, and the median relative risk for these 12 observations 1.01. On the right is what we see for true effects. So that is looking at the association between petroleum refinery workers and uh, mesotheliomia risk. And we'll see that most of the p-values, this is for 10 observational studies, most of the p-values are very small, less than 0.5. So in essence, a best fit line would plot as a very shallow slope. Okay? And the median relative risk for those set of observations, 2.47. That'll become obvious shortly. This is for large data sets. Uh, the plot on the, on the left is looking at the association between long-term exercise training and mortality and morbidity risks. That is to say, is there a benefit for long-term exercise training in uh, elderly people in reducing accidents and deaths? 45-degree line says, in fact, there is not. On the right-hand side is looking at the uh, relationship between squamous cell carcinoma, lung cancer, and smoking. And this is for 102 observational studies. We see a, uh, all the p-values, and most of them, less than 0 0.5. Now, the relative risk for the uh, plot on the left, 0 0.8, so very small. Whereas the relative, excuse me, the median relative risk for the uh, plot on the right-hand side, 12.6. Okay, big difference, strong effect. So maybe just some points that I want to make here. One second here. There we go. Okay. So what I've just shown you in these two plots are for true nulls and true effects. Now, when we looked at the median relative risk for those plots on the right, they were well in excess of the quantity that is needed to rule out bias and confounding. That is generally greater than two to three. So that'll be another measure that we can use to look at the validity of some of these research claims, in addition to the p-value plots. All right. We can't get through any of this without talking about bias, all right? And there's two types of bias, transparent and hidden. What you see mostly in literature are the transparent biases where they dance around the issue, okay? But what's really important are those hidden biases, and these are a list of hidden biases, and I know that David talked about some of them five years ago. And I'm going to elaborate further on the multiple testing issue, but I do want to talk about that first one. Researcher flexibilities. That is the root of all the bias problem in published research today. All right. In essence, researchers have infinite flexibility to manipulate the research to get the results they want. Some examples, selective design, Selective use of data, selective re analysis, and selective reporting of results. All right? So what the essence of the problem is, is that researchers can do what they want, and they can report what they want. 
All that is necessary is they write up a tight scientific story to get their paper published, hypnotize peer reviewers, because that's what's happening, and away they go. So part of our Shifting Sands project, we dug down into looking at one of these hidden biases, that's the multiple testing and multiple modeling bias issue. All right. This is where we try and estimate how many hypotheses tests do they actually do in a study. All right. Why is this important? It is typical in observational studies that thousands of hypotheses tests are performed. And it, by statistical theory, one in 20 of these could be a statistically significant but false positive result, giving the researchers many opportunities to claim statistical significance. So we're going to look at that. Leading, uh, performing many tests leads to many false positives. How do we do this? We look at three factors in papers. Uh, we look at the number of outcomes, the O's. So in my previous analogies, those are the B's, outcome B's. We also look at the number of predictors. In my previous analogy, those are the A's. How many A factors did they look at to predict the, uh, the outcomes? Or, yeah. And then we also look at covariates. And those are factors that can modify or adjust a statistical comparison between the uh, predictors and the outcomes. And uh, the so-called number of hypotheses, we call that the search base, is just the product of all three of them, as shown on the bottom. OK, let's start showing some results. <clears throat> so our first re uh, report that we published in 2021 looked at uh, research claims in environmental epidemiology. We focused on PM 2.5, and I know that um, Jim Enstrom is going to talk about that this afternoon. And, but we also looked at other uh, air quality parameters, and that's what we call them. We don't call them pollutants. Okay? Even though that you know, CO2, uh, some people call it a pollutant, it's not. It's an air quality parameter. And likewise, these other uh, ones we looked at, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, ozone, there's no difference. Carbon monoxide, excuse me, we did not look at CO2. This is from a uh, 2020 meta-analysis of 29 observational studies. The first thing you know in this p-value plot, it departs from the two types of plots that I show you, a 45 degree line, or a line with extremely shallow slope. So something like this is, uh, to us, suggests an uncertain claim or suspect. All right. Now that is further supported by if we look by the median relative risk for these 29 observations, 1.02, well below the number needed to rule out bias and confounding. All right. So the claim being tested was uh, that PM short-term PM 2.5 causes all-cause mortality. Right? Now, our claim does not support that. You know, I can say that's consistent with uh, other work that uh, Stan has published in literature. Likewise, Jim Enstrom and others, that PM 2.5 does not cause mortality. Looking at PM 2.5 and heart attacks. This is a 2012 meta-analysis of 13 observational studies. Again, we see bilinear behavior. So something that neither conforms to a true 45 or a true uh, line with a shallow slope. And this would be interpreted as being uncertain or suspect. The median, and median relative risk for these 13 observations, 1.01, .01, very weak, okay? 
So this claim also can be uh, uh, denied. Excuse me, I'm looking for the right word. PM 2.5, an asthma attack. This is a meta-analysis 2015 of 37 observational studies. Again, another bilinear pattern that we're seeing. Now, the median relative risks, excuse me, in this case, these were uh, case control studies that were, that were combined, so they used odds ratios. And the median relative, uh, excuse me, me, median odds ratios was 1.02. Again, very weak. So another claim that does not stand up. And then finally, uh, looking at PM 2.5 and oxides of nitrogen, and whether that leads to development of asthma, asthma over, say, a long period of exposure. Uh, this claim is rather interesting that uh, it, they combine these two, two, or these two uh, variables the open circles you see are PM 2.5, there's five of them. They're all over 0 0.5, they're all nulls. But if you look at the solid circles, they're NOx, and some of them are below 0 0.05. And the claim here is, was, well, both of them can lead to development of asthma, but we can't produce that by showing a proper type of effect in a p-value plot. So this claim does not stand up. So what can give us some confidence that these claims are, are false? The other thing that we looked at was the multiple testing, multiple modeling bias issue in different types of air quality studies. What you see here are all published numbers. All right. So um, these are the median estimates of, uh, for different types of studies, heart attack, asthma attack, asthma development, and then also outside of shifting sands, we looked at the uh, gas stove NO2 asthma issue, which clearly is a bunch of nonsense. But uh, what you see here is that it's typical for at least 12,000 statistical hypotheses to be tested in a single study. So that would be a typical study. Why is this large? Well, um, under ideal conditions, an analysis is set to claim statistical significance 5% of the time. So any researcher having the typical number of hypotheses tests performed, 12,000, would expect to have 5% of that, or 600 significant but false positive results from which they can choose from to write and publish a paper. And that's how you do bad air quality health effect studies. All right. Our second, second report was uh, looking at claims in the field of nutritional epidemiology. Now, I think David spends a fair bit of his time thinking up titles, if you look at it. Flimsy food findings, food frequency questionnaires, false positives, and fallacious procedures in nutritional epidemiology. Why is this important that we looked at, at this? Well, the Food and Drug Administration uses nutritional epidemiology to support their scientific evidence on their recommendations and their regulations. We looked at two types of claims. One of them, the claim that uh, red meat causes disease. And then the other one, if you can't eat red meat, let's force everyone into, uh, well, we could, they could eat soy, right? So we looked at the claim of uh, whether soy protein is beneficial to heart health. Now, two types of, uh, or two components are used in nutritional epidemiology. One of them is food frequency questionnaires, and uh, the other one is uh, cohort populations. So food frequency questionnaires is a structured food list and a subject response section for subjects 
that it fill out from memory their usual intake of various food components over a period of time. And then after a, some, some lapse of time, the subjects self-report their health symptoms. And the researchers can, can then make statistical, statistical comparisons between different food items, beverage items, and their health symptoms. Cohort studies, those are the populations used in these types of uh, research projects. They start with hundreds to thousands of subjects that are followed over an extended period of time. Now, it makes it easier for researchers to publish multiple studies because a lot of these data are archived and the researchers can go back to the trough and grab more data, publish another study, or when new survey data gets added, grab it and publish another study. These types of analysis lead to many hypotheses tests being formed and many false positives. Red and processed meats. So we looked at a 2019 meta-analysis that examined 30 health outcomes and from 105 nutritional observational studies. First off, this was a good study, good science, because they questioned the link between red meat and health outcomes. The perfect example for us to look at one side of the fence, uh, do our p-value plots work? So we selected six of their 30 health, out, uh, health outcomes, <clears throat> and then we also estimated the number of hypotheses tests, just to see if multiple testing bias was an issue. So these are the six uh, p-value plots that we generated. I'll, I'll walk you through them. They're all numbered. So uh, first one, all-cause mortality. And the second one, uh, excuse me, number three, all cancer mortality. So top left and then directly below, we see bilinear behavior. <clears throat> so that tells us that uh, we judge those, uh, those associations to be um, uncertain or suspect, all right? So if we look at the top right, the number two, cardiovas cardiovascular mortality, directly below number four, breast cancer mortality incidence, excuse me, and then the bottom left, number five, colorectal cancer incidence. These actually plot as a 45 degree line. So these are, in essence, true nulls. Now that number six, type two diabetes, so that's the bottom right. You might think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of the observations below 0.05 that, is that a true, true effect? But we're showing you two triangles, one pointing down right on the, right on the uh, left hand side, one pointing down, one pointing up. That one pointing down is for an observational study that showed a negative effect. More red meat leads to less type 2 diabetes. The one immediately beside it was a positive effect, likewise for all those others. In essence, how can that be a true effect? Well, let's clarify that a bit more. We selected 15 papers randomly from that list of 105 studies and counted the number of hypotheses tests. And I'll just, if you look at what's circled in the red there in the middle, the median, that would be a typical study, would have started with about 51 foods, and they would looked at three diseases, three outcomes, and used 15 of those foods in their statistical comparisons, and about nine covariates. That leads to about 20,000 Statistical hypotheses tests for a typical study. And by, by analogy from before, 5.5% of those could be statistically significant 
but false positives, or 1,000. So that leads lots of opportunities for these researchers to cherry pick one of those results, write and publish a paper. And that is how you publish bad nutrition disease studies. And just to re uh, reiterate, um, we were able to support the meta-analysis researchers' claims because they doubted that, met, that uh, red meat leads to disease. And our p-value plot supported those. Uh, soy protein, cardiovascular disease. Several years ago, the Food and Drug Administration was deciding whether to revoke a soy protein heart health claim. Now, I'm pretty sure that got the soy industry a bit nervous, but uh, nevertheless, in 2019, a meta-analysis was published that used the FDA's data set. And these were randomized controlled trials. There are 46 uh, studies that provided 50 separate data sets with relative risks and confidence intervals. So we did the same thing, take those data, convert them to p-values plot, and then look at the multiple testing bias issue. So this is the plot testing the claim that uh, soy protein lowers your bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. And the plot we can clearly see that uh, is bilinear, many nulls. I think there were 38. The median relative risk, less than 1, 0.97. So clearly this is an uncertain or suspect research claim. So the multiple testing and multiple modeling bias. We randomly selected nine papers from their list of 46 and counted the number of hypotheses tests. These are randomized trials. Typically, they would pre-specify one outcome and uh, one predictor, and randomization tends to uh, deal with a lot of the uh, covariates that uh, observational studies find necessary. The median number of hypotheses was only 24, much lower than an observational study. All right. However, when we look at the p-value plots, which showed predominantly nulls, bilinear behavior, and the weak effect of the median relative risk, um, you know, we came to a judgment that uh, soy does not lower LDL cholesterol. And looks like FDA was, was right in the direction that they were pursuing. I don't know what happened because COVID hit and we don't really know uh, wh where they're at on this issue. All right. So our third study was looking at uh, claims related to COVID science. Uh, hot potato, obviously. And we looked at two non-pharmaceutical interventions, lockdown and masking. And according to the narrative, both would reduce uh, COVID infections and fatalities among the public. Mm -hmm. So here our work only focused on p-value plotting. So for lockdowns, we looked at four outcomes, but I'm only going to show you two. One's related to uh, mortality and uh, domestic violence. Uh, the others are shown in our report. So. <clears throat> so this is a meta-analysis done by uh, Steve Hank's group at uh, John Hopkins University. Very capable researchers. Very good analysis. Uh, we judged that quickly for, because when he released his uh, study in, I think it was 2022, there was a meltdown on the internet didn't conform to the, to the narrative. He actually withdrew his study, redid it, found the same things, published it. And today, last year, it was published as a book. All right? So he was right. 
so we were able to uh, get 20 data sets uh, f uh, from that study, convert them into p-value plots, and that's what you see here. All right. So a, uh, clearly not a true effect. All right. And supporting uh, Steve Hanks. Uh, claim of no benefit from, from lockdowns. Domestic violence. Um, we had prior knowledge, if you look at uh, uh, the relationship between isolation and domestic, domestic violence. That's pretty solid. So lockdowns is a form of isolation. Um, this was uh, 17 observational studies, and what we see here is that the majority of them have small p-values. So, in essence, a best fit line would be a very shallow slope. All right? So, this is consistent with what would be a true as association, and also consistent with their research claim, and also consistent with the uh, extensive literature on the association between isolation and domestic violence. Okay. Masking. Uh, we focus strictly on, if you look at the lady in the middle there, she's got that blue medical mask, the one you wear, you know, in a true setting for 30 to 60 minutes in the operating theater, and then you, you get rid of it because it doesn't work anymore. Um, we evaluated meta-analysis and systematic reviews using three literature searches. I'll explain that right away. Uh, specifically looking at um, medical masks, public use of medical masks for viral infection. So it could be influenza or COVID. Uh, the period that we identified these studies was January 1, 2020 to January 7, 2022, so a 35-month period. There were lots of meta-analysis, lots, okay? Probably 15 or so. We narrowed our uh, criteria to only those meta-analysis that uh, dealt with randomized trials. We wanted to get rid of the bias issue. So only randomized trials. So that narrowed it down to this list here, okay? Um, another thing that we did was uh, we also looked into the studies, those studies that were included in the meta-analysis or combined, and we wanted to establish whether they uh, in included self-reported information of a viral symptom. Now, self-reported uh, symptoms, based on my previous experience, before I got into this, is very sketchy information. So if we could identify those studies, we kicked them out. In some cases, we had to kick the meta-analysis meta out because there was too heavily reliance on uh, self-reported symptoms. And then maybe just from a practical perspective, uh, the, you know, the medical mass were never intended to work to stop a respiratory virus for a person, all right? Uh, if you look at the characteristics, and that literature is out there, um, they're, uh, they're ineffective for being able to stop the aerosols that contain the virus, number one. Number two, when you breathe, you exhale, can't remember how many thousands of particles uh, of aerosols per, per breath, such that within 30 to 60 minutes, depending on your breathing rate, you plug up the masks. So all that does is increase the air intake from above, sides, and below. So unless you want to have some level effect, given that they don't work to begin with, you would have to change them every 30 to 60 minutes, all right? So those were kind of our starting points. I'm going to show you two p-value plots. So one from, uh, our, we identified from Cochrane literature that met our, our criteria. This was a Cochrane review study by Tom Jefferson. And... Uh, 
He did these every couple years. I can't remember if this was his fourth or his fifth. And he always found the same thing. All right, mass don't work. Here's a p-value plot from his 2020 review that showed that. Nice 45 degree angle. Of course, the internet had a meltdown, right? He had to withdraw his study. He redid it, found the same thing, published it. And then the Cochrane editorial boards, who was, whatever, playing the woke game, said, well, we're going to have to, we're going to have to review his conclusions. Nothing was done until a couple of weeks ago, where they just published that uh, we've decided we're not going to review the, the conclusions, all right? So that's how the game is played at the higher up. But anyhow, so this was a very clear, uh, effective null association between mass and, and viral infection. Another one, which uh, probably didn't get enough exposure, was a study published by the Cato Institute. This was a systematic review. And it too plots like a very consistent 45 degree angle. This is a table in our, re our report that summarizes everything. I'm not gonna point out everything. I'd just like you to focus on the, uh, on the first column on the left-hand side. We did the three literature reviews, the Cochrane review. Uh, we looked at general medical literature using the uh, National Institutes of Health uh, uh, PubMed database, and then a general literature search. So we identified those eight studies all using randomized trials. We, we found lots of observational studies, and of course, mass, they work great, all right? But they're too much bias, right? And if you go to the fourth column on the uh, right-hand side, uh, what we're doing is just providing a summary is, were we able to reproduce the researcher's claim that masks don't work or they do work? you'll see two unable to determine because they relied, these are randomized studies that relied heavily on sketchy self-reported information. So trying to, we just ignored that, okay, we kicked them out. And then where we have the yeses, we were, our plots were able to reproduce researchers' claims that masks don't work. And the two no's, our plots, we're not able to reproduce the claim that masks work. This is all in our report. So, you know, if you want to say, do masks work? And no, they don't. I don't know, you may have to wear one if they force you, but if you're thinking you're going to stop a respiratory virus, that's not going to happen. Okay? And, you know, just like, uh, just like uh, uh, Ross's, um, uh, you know, adventures with, with journals, uh, it's very clear today that most journals and their editorials, e editors fiercely protect the positions that have been established by previous papers published. So if they've published papers that say climate is bad, they're going to take a real hard look and you have to work real hard to get it past the editorial board to get peer reviewers to actually review it. And we've had not lots of instances where they just look at it and say, oh, well, no, doesn't work, because it's going to make them look bad, so they just reject it. That's the way the game is played, that publication bias component. Right? We actually got that study published. This study. The first journal wanted us to start putting in statements that had nothing to do with what we studied. They said, okay, medical masks don't work, but what those N95 masks do? We want you to put that statement in there. So we decided we just pull the study because we could see the bias in the editors right away. Okay, so this implicit bias was our fourth report. Uh, it's, uh, we expect to have it finalized sometime in the fall. Um, we needed a uh, 
high wattage, you know, a helmet with a high wattage light bulb to try to understand this science, okay? So what I'm saying, it uh, was very challenging compared to the other areas that we looked at. And maybe I can just explain that, uh, you know, there are three ways to characterize bias, okay? So what do I mean by that is, uh, is bias in how uh, groups of people look at a topic. It could be wealth, it could be race, it could be gender, or something else, all right? Those three methods. One of them is, uh, you know, I don't know if it's good science, but uh, it makes a lot of sense, is where you actually observe groups of people and what their behaviors and actions are, all right? So we'll call that the, the good science road. And uh, we'll call it a path, you know, and you're in a bush. So the second method is if you were to veer maybe 30 to 45 degrees off the path into the bush, uh, it, that's referred to as explicit bias. And that is characterized through uh, surveys and questionnaires on groups of people, and somehow they can quantify that bias. Uh, the third one is where if you were to take a hard right or a hard right left into the bush, is this area of uh, implicit bias, subconscious bias. All right. And uh, it is established by a test that was uh, on the computer, developed by researchers at Harvard. And it's a speed response test. And if you take it, I've taken it, and I can't remember what topic it was. There's about 10 or 11 up there, and I'm biased. But um, um, it claims to be able to measure that subconscious implicit bias in a person. Now this is extremely important because this is the science grounding the framework of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. Okay, this is heavy stuff. So um, the way that researchers actually do these studies, you know, the, the supporters of a, a implicit bias, what they're trying to do is show that implicit bias is real, and we can show it's real by correlating with real-world observations, okay? So that's what they're arguing. And then there's a lot of science out there which doesn't get enough attention, obviously, that is, is legitimately critical, that is showing that, in, in fact, implicit bias is not correlated, and in fact, maybe not meaningful at all. So this was an opportunity for us to look on both sides of the fence, okay? When they, the, those that support implicit bias as being real, and those that are critical of implicit bias re, being real. So we looked at uh, two topics, racial bias and gender bias. So implicit bias is measured by a computer test, all right? And what meta-analysis are doing, are, are asking the question, does a, uh, they call it the implicit association test, IAT. Does the IAT test score correlate positively with real world observations? And there's various types of ways to characterize that. The one that we show here, referred to as uh, micro behaviors. So what are they? Measures of verbal and subtle verbal behavior, okay? Um, we looked at one other in our report, and we published a paper on that too, but anyhow, I just wanna focus on this. First of all, this plot is clearly, clearly departs from something that would show a true association or effect. It's bilinear. All right, so there we can conclude that, uh, that you know, the so-called um, relationship between the IAT test score and real-world microbehaviors is not true. If we look 
But those individual, this one had uh, 83 data sets. 50 of them were circles. Those are the ones that have positive associations between the test score and the uh, real world measure. And there's 30 of them. They're downward triangles. They had negative associations. So clearly this is not a, uh, something that we judge as being real. And in fact, this uh, um, particular meta-analysis was done by Philip Tetlock's group, and some people may have heard him, from the University of Pennsylvania, very capable researchers. And he questioned the validity of implicit bias as being a reliable measure of bias. And our plot here agrees with that. Gender bias. Uh, this was the data from a meta-analysis from a group from Harvard. And they claim they found significant implicit criterion correlations. So their real-world measure, they called it criterion, and that uh, was, the definition was observations, measurements of real-world gender-related measures, including gender attitude, gender stereotype, and gender identity. We have a p-value plot of 20, 27 observations from that study. It's not an ideal 45-degree line, but they're all null effects. They're all greater than 0, 0,5. So clearly this is a, something that is a, a so-called relationship is un, uh, uncertain or highly suspect. We actually, uh, with Stan, that tried to follow up with uh, the lead researcher at Harvard to uh, try to get some feedback, but just typically ignored us. And I've sort of heard that several times if you want to get opinion from the other side, they'll just typically ignore you, all right? So here is another claim that, that we could not reproduce. So what would be the takeaways, you know, when you walk away from here, what I would like you to remember? Well, clearly bad science is much more common in literature than good science today, no doubt about that. Um, we try to use p-value plots that looked on both sides of the fence, bad science and good science. What was obvious to us, and Stan nailed it perfectly, we pretty much see a snake or a scorpion under the methodology rock of a bad science study with a questionable research claim. Mm -hmm. Our p-value plots could not reproduce claims made from bad science, but could do so for good science. So, you know, we would argue and promote and suggest that uh, these tools, both p-value plotting and search space estimating, these numbers of hypotheses tests, are very valuable for trying to establish the irreproducibility or falseness of research claims. And maybe I thought I'd just leave you with, uh, these are all the URLs for the uh, studies that we've uh, published so far. And that is it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Great information, thank you. Um, I think we do have a few, a, a little bit of time for questions, but also uh, lunch is ready. So if uh, so if you want to get lunch, why don't you go ahead and and head over there, and we'll take some questions too, if if there are some. Okay, I think we got. Okay. We'll let him and then you, Jonathan. You, you did the mass, mass studies that showed no correlation with prevention of spread of infection. Did you do any uh, of the six-foot distancing studies uh, uh, where people were supposed to stay six feet apart? 
No, it did, did not. You, no. Did, did you? Did you? Okay. Because no. no. what I'm reading now is obviously they didn't work okay. either. Well, you know, I would just from track following the literature, I those claims do not hold up. That would be our judgment, and I'm sure we could show them if we had the appropriate data. Okay. But those, in essence, those claims don't, would not. Well, did you ever look at, uh, I think it's Niles or Neil Ferguson's original data projecting? Oh, yes. What, what was your assessment of that? Uh, well, uh, there have been several independent evaluations of his model, and it's junk. Okay. Yeah. And he had done a previous one. Yeah. 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 You know, uh, those type of people like to make predictions so they can. Say whatever they want, but it's junk. Yeah. Why, uh, why isn't this type of p-testing that you did like a standard for journals? So doesn't it seem like it should be sort of a requirement, a baseline? Well, you know, it's an excellent question, but journals don't like to publish reproducibles reproducibility of science, particularly if they've published a study and this reproducibility um, nullifies their, that previously published study's claim. They don't want to look bad. There's no benefit to them. They like exciting research that gets readers, but they don't want to publish the truth. And do any of them go back afterwards when, when a reproducibility study like yours comes out and say, oh, by the way, this study we published three years ago, there's this information. Now. They don't do that. They don't do that. I boy, see. oh boy, you know, the, we, we did an evaluation of uh, gas stoves and, uh, and NO2 causing asthma. And, uh, you know, the actual analysis that we used, at the time, it generated a lot of news last year. Well, that journal that published that study had it front and center on their web page. They were bragging of how many people were looking at it and everything. That's what they're like. They don't care about the truth. Interesting. Yeah. It's a shame. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're looking for. You've, you've nailed it right on the head. Warren, a very nice uh, presentation. What I would like to know is if you've tried to publish any of the uh, specific items that you're listing over here uh, to maybe the appropriate journals that deal with those subjects? They've been rejected easily. These types of studies do not make it past the editor because the journals you refer to have already published claims that air, you know, air quality, PM 2.5, leads to heart attacks. They don't want to suffer any harm to their reputation, so we can't get by the editors. Have you kept the uh, rejection oh. uh, letters? No, or? unfortunately. Oh, okay. No. I, I mean, that's a very good point. Too. I mean, it's just, it helps document further exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, thank you again for the talk. Thank you for the talk. I'm Dr. Donny Parton from Yuma, Arizona. I'm, I'm an anesthesiologist. For record, there was on the boxes of the surgical masks, masks that we wear, said it does not explicitly protect either transmission or, or acquiring of uh, infection. Since then, the boxes have removed that claim on it. It doesn't say for or against. So we don't use these masks to protect ourselves or the patient. It is just to protect particle droplets from going into the wound. Yes. Yeah. In a way, there still is a benefit for for physicians. You know, uh, there's there's no doubt. But for a public member to to wear a mask for a period of time in an infected uh, space, that doesn't work. Also, if these viruses were located in a level four biology, bio labs, there is a distinct purpose of protection there, which we cannot accomplish it with our meager means. That is correct. You mentioned evidence-based medicine. Someone, uh, and it was a journalist, not a 
physician or anybody fancy, said, this is wrong. What evidence-based medicine does, when it's done right, it, it will give a certain amount of certainty to what they're saying. But that doesn't mean that's all the knowledge there is. What he said was, all available evidence. Right. And uh, this showed up very well with something that somebody refused to publish. It wasn't my stuff, it was something else. But the fellow did five observational studies. That is, he had five patients that certain um, artificial sugar, NutraSweet, and they had symptoms. He took them off the uh, NutraSweet. The symptoms went away. He tried to and was able to put some of them back on it. The symptoms came. And then later, he had some people that had gotten better, but they got the symptoms back. And when they checked, they found out they were getting the NutraSweet and something else. Now, if that isn't pretty good science, I don't know what is. But yeah. they refused to publish it on the basis that it was anecdotal. I'm not, I'm not surprised. Yeah. I'm not surprised.